Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, we're going to continue our afternoon session with Edivaldo. It's his first time during the meeting. Thank you so much. For those who, are, who don't know, Edivaldo is also a member of CTA, and he's now recently joined uh, a very interesting endeavor concerning direct arc metal detection. So that's also quite interesting. So thank you so much, Edivaldo, for being here, and take your time. Okay, thank you, Farinaldo. Thank you, the organization, for the opportunity to talk. Um, so I'll say a few words on uh, what are the prospects for uh, studying AGN populations, in fact, blazer populations. I'll make it clear uh, exactly what I mean in a few minutes um, with, with the future data of CTA. Um, and... Uh, but before that, let's just um, uh, have a look at the gamma ray sky and what is the situation now. So I took here as an, as an example the full sky map of, um, of Fermi, uh, the Fermi LAT all sky, um, all sky map. And as you, you, you can see, uh, this uh, bright emission uh, in, in gamma rays uh, measured by, by Fermi. And then we can um, see if we can identify and what are these uh, sources uh, of gamma rays that Fermi LAT um, um, uh, sees. And uh, here um, is uh, an example, blazers, uh, these uh, AGNs that I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about in a, few, in a few minutes. So blazers are seen as kind of point sources in the, in the Fermi all-sky map. They are uh, all over the place. Um, so their distribution is co cosmological. Um, you see pulsars uh, very correlated with the galactic plane. Um, so these are galactic pulsars. You can also see some pulsars at high galactic latitude. Um, you also see normal galaxies. Normal galaxies also emit uh, gamma rays. So you can see here the large, the large and the small Magellanic Cloud, uh, M82, M31, uh, NGC 253. So normal galaxies also shine in gamma rays. Uh, and you have supernova remnants, uh, very correlated also with the plane of our galaxies. So uh, this is more or less the main sources of, of gamma rays um, um, that show up in the, in the um, Fermi all sky map. But you also see this diffuse emission uh, from unresolved sources um, all over the sky. Uh, so I'm going to focus basically on those blazers, right? So in order to do that, we have to talk a little bit about the difference between an AGN, an active galactic nuclei, and a normal galaxy, okay? Um, so a normal galaxy. So the light of, the, of a normal, normal galaxy can be understood as a superposition, basically, of black bodies. Huh? You just take the stars inside the galaxy, treat, treat them as, uh, as black bodies, put all these black bodies together, and you have a pretty good approximation of what the uh, spectrum of a normal galaxy is, right? So it's going to be a superposition of, uh, of, of the star uh, spectrum. Uh, with the stars have temperatures in the range of 3,000 to 40,000 uh, Kelvins. Um, so uh, that's pretty much what a normal galaxy um, um, uh, is from the spectral point of view. So you see that the emission will be contained mainly in the uh, visible and ultraviolet, for example, basically. Um, here is uh, uh, a good example of, of the uh, luminosity distribution as a function of frequency for a normal galaxy, right? So the spectrum is pretty much contained in a very narrow range of, of frequency in the optical and UV. But when you look at an AGN, so you see emission essentially across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Huh? So you can see emission from radio uh, from to visible to uh, you know X rays and all the way to gamma rays. So this is a typical spectrum of a of a quasar. Um, and also another difference is that their luminosity is uh, at least uh, 1,000 times the luminosity of a, of a normal galaxy. And from the shape of this spectrum, you can already um, conclude that whatever is driving this luminosity, it is not a thermal process. It has to be something um, out of equilibrium. Um, and uh, another difference is that uh, all this emission, this more than 1,000 uh, uh, normal galaxy luminosity, is not coming from the whole galaxy. It's coming from a very particular region inside the galaxy, which is the, 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 the very 
uh, core of the galaxy. So here's just an image in the optical of, uh, of, uh, of an AGN uh, for different exposure times. So in the beginning, you only see the core of the galaxy, and if you want to see the whole galaxy, you need to uh, observe for much, much longer time. So most of this luminosity is coming from a very compact region in the center um, of the galaxy. Huh? Um, here are just some properties of AGNs. Uh, so just to stress that uh, the luminosity of the AGN is measured in, in solar luminosities. Uh, you will find different classes. Um, oh, so normal galaxies uh, less than uh, 10, 10 to the 4 uh, solar luminosities. And then you have these radio galaxies, uh, Seaford galaxies, which are kind of low luminosity uh, AGNs. And then you have the most lumino luminous uh, objects, which are the quasars and and and, and blazers, uh, where you can have uh, up to 10 to the 14 um, the solar luminosities. Um, and also the masses, right? So uh, the, the mass of the, sup of the black hole in the center of the AGN compared to the, to the solar masses. For normal, normal galaxies, the supermassive black holes will be uh, at the order of a million um, um, uh, solar masses. But when you reach the quasar and blazer um, region, uh, the masses uh, are can reach to the ten to one billion solar masses, hmm? uh, and um, I won't go into details on what is the physics, uh, um, uh, the, the inner physics of these uh, uh, supermassive black holes. I think Walter uh, tomorrow will talk a lot about these, the the physics of the supermassive black hole. But the the way we understand these nowadays is that. Uh, in these galaxies, there is a, a supermassive black hole in the center. There's a relativistic jet uh, um, coming out of the, of the black hole. There's an accretion disk. There's a, a, a thorough of gas and, and, and dust. And then there's also gas uh, 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 above and below the, the thorough. And depending on the viewing angle of the observer, you will either see a quasar uh, or a blazer or a Seifert uh, um, uh, type of galaxy. Uh, because that de that depends on the, also on the absorption uh, on the line of sight and things like that. But I, you know, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, you will hear I, I I think much more about that uh, um, tomorrow. And then, uh, but let's look at these blazers. This is a special kind of AGNs, right? So. Uh, how can you differentiate them? At least from the observational point of view, if you look at the optical uh, spectrum of, of, of these blazers, you see two types, what we call BL-LAC, uh, and what we call flat spectrum radio quasar, uh, for a reason, right? This black spectrum is pretty much uh, um, uh, flat. But you can see a difference, a clear difference between these two objects is that for flat spectrum, you clearly have emission and absorption lines in the optical, and that allows you to determine the redshift of these, uh, of these sources uh, with, pretty m with a good precision. Uh, but that's not the case for BLACs, and, and this is a problem for, for us. So most of the, uh, of the AGNs that CTA uh, will see in the high redshift universe will be BLACs. And then to determine the redshift of these objects will be a problem. So this is something that we need to um, uh, uh, solve in some way. Right? It's hard to determine redshifts of, of BLX, and they're going to be uh, the dominating objects uh, uh, that CTA will see in the high redshift universe. Um, so before going into a study of the populations, uh, of these AGN populations, I want to make a detour here now uh, because there's something very important uh, that you need to understand before you do any population studies uh, concerning AGNs, um, especially at the TV energy range. So maybe um, I think Manuel also talked about this before, that um, the emission at the TV energy scale from sources cosmologically distributed will get to Earth attenuated by the EBL, right? So, and you have to take into account that um, absorption before you do any study on the intrinsic properties of the AGN, because the spectrum gets to Earth distorted. So part of the, of the radiation is absorbed in, in the extragalactic medium. So I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about this uh, uh, um, now. And here is the process. So you have a, a powerful AGN um, very far away from the observer emitting uh, gamma radiation. These gamma rays propagate uh, through the extragalactic medium. And they start to encounter 
low energy radiation, what I mean with low energy, optical, UV, infrared, photons in the extragalactic medium. So you have photon, photon scattering in the extragalactic medium, and you produce C plus E minus pairs. Huh? So uh, uh, essentially, you're absorbing the high energy radiation and producing E plus E minus pairs. So if you observe, uh, uh, so if you, if you in, the, in the source, you have a spectrum like this, so probably at Earth, you see something like that. Um, and you have to account for this absorption. So in some way, you need to know how many photons uh, per cubic meter or you know, per, uh, cubic, per megaparsec cubic in the extragalactic medium you have in order to actually make this correction. Right? Um, the process is very pretty much uh, none in physics. It's a clean quantum electrodynamic process in which a very high energy photon couples with a low energy photon through the exchange uh, of, a, of an, an electron, uh, a lepton in this case. And uh, so the cross-section is, is pretty much none, theoretically. Of course, it's hard to observe this, this process in, in, in the laboratory because it has a, a high energy threshold. So the threshold, of course, is the minimum energy to produce an E plus E minus, at least at rest in, in the laboratory. And of course, you need a, 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 a minimum flux in order to the probability uh, of the scattering to be uh, reasonable. Uh, but it's, it's uh, from the theoretical point of view, this is very well known, uh, and you can calculate the cross-section uh, with a high precision. Um, and, but these, this has dramatic consequences on the way high-energy photons propagate through the universe. Okay? So a very high-energy photon will not propagate freely in the universe for, for, for too long. Uh, depending on its energy, it's going to encounter one of these low-energy photons and basically disappear. Um, and here is the mean free path of, of, a, of a gamma ray as a function of, of its energy. Um, and you can see uh, that the mean free path drops very fast uh, around these energies of 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 electron volt. And you can see that around 10 to the 15 or 16, the uh, mean free path is the size of our galaxy, basically. So around 10 to the 15 or 16 electron volt, we expect that gamma rays are coming from our galaxy and not from, from the extragalactic medium, okay? Uh, but uh, but uh, CTA is around here, right? CTA is around here, 10 to the 12 um, uh, electron, electron volts. So you can read what is the typical mean free pass around hundreds of, of megaparsec. Um, and... Uh, this uh, solid black line here represents the interaction only with the cosmic microwave background, basically, right? Uh, and then when you include also the light of the galaxies in this low ra radiation fields, you get this, this dotted uh, red uh, curve here. Um, so CMB is important, but it's important uh, uh, at high energies uh, around 10 to the 15 or 16 electron volts. Huh? Uh, but what we, are, we have to worry about is uh, photons in the infrared and optical uh, wavelengths uh, range uh, in order to do the, that uh, absorption correction for the, for the uh, CTA, CTA measurements. Okay? Um, so here's just the optical depth uh, of, these, uh, of the extragalactic medium. Uh, since there is a probability for these photons to interact uh, uh, on, on the way to Earth, you can calculate an optical depth, as if you were in, inside a plasma, for example. And uh, these optical depth will be dependent on the redshift and also on the energy at the same time. So you can uh, see here what we call a cosmic gamma ray horizon. So this dotted line here marks exactly uh, where the transition happens, where you have to worry about this absorption process. Huh? It will depend on the energy of the gamma ray and also on how far the source is. So the farther the source and the higher the energy of the photon, uh, the higher the uh, optical depth. So you have more absorption. Um, um, so, as I said, if you just start with a simple power law spectrum at the, at the source, and then you start to include absorption, you get things like this. So, so this is not real data, huh? so this is a synthetic source, a Monte Carlo uh, generated uh, artificial source, and just placed at uh, different redshift, at, at, at different distances uh, from the observer. 
uh, from redshift to 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. Uh, and there's two, basically two models um, um, uh, shown here. Um, so these are two different models for the low energy photons. Huh? So uh, nowadays there are uh, uncertainties on how many of those low energy photons in the infrared or, or, or visible uh, wavelengths is how many of them are in the in the extragalactic medium. So here are two different ways to make this calculation. But you see uh, the same trend. Uh, as the energy of the photon reaches a certain threshold, you start to basically um, attenuate the, the high energy um, radiation. Okay. Um, um, right. So here's a, for a hypothetical source with this. Um, uh, spectral energy distribution, a simple power law, and you see that the attenuation uh, is unimportant for energies below 100 GeV. Okay, so, um, so Fermi, Fermi uh, you can see signs of absorption, but it, it won't be uh, as important as in the CTA energy range. As soon as we get to the TeV energy range, then there's no way to, to neglect, neglect this absorption. Okay. Um, and here, this is Fermilat data. This is Fermilat data. So this is the, what is plotted here is the energy, uh, the, the maximum energy of a photon from a given extragalactic source, an AGN, for example, and the redshift of the source, and the redshift of the source. So this is, this is uh, LAT data. Um, and here is the cosmic gamma ray horizon. So here is that curve, that theoretical curve that tells you uh, in which region you have to actually worry about absorption. And you see here that most of the sources, they tend to, you know, crowd below that, that, uh, that curve. Huh? That makes sense, right? Because the, um, the optical depth is as small in this region as, as you cross this line, so the optical depth become greater than one. Uh, so this is kind of, a, of a, an indication that absorption is affecting um, the sources from, from, from Fermi, okay? Um, you can also see more quantitative um, indication of this. So here is the uh, observed spectral index. Okay, so these photons from a given source, they reach Earth, you measure the SED, you measure the spectrum, measure, uh, fit the spectrum and measure the spectral index, and also you plot as a spectral index as a function of, of redshift. So there are three different uh, data points here. Uh, these uh, green, these gray ones, then the blue ones, and then this, uh, you know, uh, yellowish one, ones, and uh, these different data points they come from different energy ranges inside the inside Fermi lat. So you see that the high energy sample is this one called 2FHL, uh, in which the photons go from 50 to 2 uh, TV basically, and then there's a low energy. Um, a sample here from 0 0.1 to 100 GeV and an intermediate uh, energy range. Huh? And you can see that the low energy data, uh, there's no clear trend uh, in the behavior of the spectral index as a function of redshift, but as you move to uh, larger energy data, you start to see the uh, spectral index tilt a little bit, and then for the very high energy data, the, the spectral index uh, tilt even more. So these spectrums are becoming softer and softer as they reach Earth. Uh, so there's more and more absorption. The, absor uh, the absorption is um, uh, heavier or larger at high redshift, as, as we expect, right? and, and also at uh, higher energies. Uh, um, okay, so... So then it becomes very important to know how many of these low energy photons are hanging around in the extragalactic medium, okay? Um, so how can you calculate that? Um, so if you are in the optical or UV, so most of these photons are being produced by stars uh, inside galaxies, normal galaxies or even AGNs, but uh, uh, so galaxies are producing this, so stars inside galaxies are producing this these optical and UV photons. So in some way, if you want to uh, calculate the energy density of these photons in the extragalactic medium, you have to have some handle on what we call the luminosity uh, function. Uh, uh, so you have to know um, how many sources with a given luminosity in the optical or, or UV at a given redshift are there in the universe. 
and you have to integrate over all these this, uh, uh, source luminosities in order to get the, the energy density. You can then translate this also into a number density of photons in the extragalactic medium. So it basically involves an integral in redshift, um, as it is, is given here. Um, so as I said, main contribution are coming from starlight at UV and optical, but dust also emit um, uh, in the infrared. So the way we see this is that the stars are shining. Part of this is, is of this starlight escapes the, the galaxy, but one part gets trapped inside the, the galaxy by dust. So dust absorbs, uh, heats up, and then re-emits in the infrared. So that will also contribute to, the, to these low energy photons. AGN might also contribute. We don't know. That's an open question, but maybe AGN contributes to these low energy photons. And then when also when people run simulation in the computer, they, they get to the conclusion that the first stars that um, appeared in the universe were much different than the ones that we observe today. Huh? We call these the population tree stars. They were much, much heavier, much, much massive. And... Um, you can also think that maybe if these this, uh, stars, these first, first and second generation stars really existed in the universe, they also contributed to the EBL at some point at high redshift. Uh, and you can think about the exotic emissions. Huh? Uh, here, the, there's no limit for your imagination. Huh? You can also come with exotic emissions. And of course, uh, uh, this emission is happening in, a, in an expanding universe, so you have to have a background cosmology in order to uh, track how this density of photons is evolving with time. Um, um, fro so from the th theoretical point of view, you have to solve a Boltzmann equation, basically, uh, to track the EBL brightness as a function of time. And in this Boltzmann equation, there's going to be basically a co the competition of uh, two terms. There is the expansion rate. So as the universe expands, it dilutes the number of low energy photons. Huh? And at the same time, new photons are being injected in the extragalactic medium. So this is the source term. So here we will enter the stars huh? and, uh, and, and dust. Huh? So stars and dust uh, uh, enters here. So you can solve for this equation, you can integrate this, this differential equation, and, and then you have a formal solution for the intensity as a function of wavelengths and as a function of time as well. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, a, a very important ingredient here is what I, I'm calling commoving emissivity. Uh, so how many photons per cubic megaparsec are being injected as a function of time? Um, uh, in the extragalactic medium. But you can actually, in principle, you can solve that. Uh, there are odd, so what are the ingredients that enters into this um, uh, commoving emissivity? So if stars are, are a big part of, of this of these, uh, uh, radiation, which by the way, I haven't given a name so far, uh, we call it EBL, extragalactic background light, uh, basically, to differentiate from, from CMB and stuff like that. But of course, if the stars are a big part of these, uh, of the, of these sources, you have to know uh, how stars evolve in time, how they are born, how they move along the, the HR diagram. Um, so that's one, one thing that you need. Uh, you also need to know um, what is the probability for a, given, for a star to be born with a given mass? This is, this is what we, we call uh, initial mass function, and that's what's plotted here. So it's basically a probability for a given uh, star to be born with a given mass. So, uh, so in some senses, uh, at which uh, point in this diagram does a star enter, right? Uh, you have to know uh, how... how um, uh, what, what is the rate at which stars are being born? So this is given by the star formation rate function here as a function of redshift. And you also need this extra piece of information, which is this, the probability for a photon to escape from a galaxy. Uh, because that, that is important. I, I, I told you that a fraction of the photons will be absorbed inside the galaxy, and they will hit dust, which will re-emit in the infrared. So it's important to know how these... Uh, 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 escape probability um, behaves as a function of wavelengths. But if you put everything together inside this commoving emissivity, you get things like this. Well, this is the final result. So you cook everything, and that's what you're going to get. So this is the uh, 
uh, what we call the, the energy density of, of EBL photons as a function of redshift. And here you can see clearly the, the, the three contribution, um, um, several contributions. So this first uh, curve here, this um, dotted uh, red line, is the stellar contribution. So this is direct to starlight, uh, energy coming directly from stars. And then you have all these contributions here, these other um, uh, contributions, uh, which uh, appears in the mid-infrared and the near to far infrared. So this is dust. So this was dust heated on the galaxies and, and then re-emitting in the infrared. And, and you can see here three different contributions. There are molecules that are um, uh, complex uh, um, uh, molecules in, in, the, in the interstellar medium and, and, and other two types of, of, of dust. And so this is a simple model in which you basically try to explain the EBL energy density with basically four components, stars and three types of uh, dust grain in the interstellar medium. Uh, this is not the only model. You will find uh, several others in the literature. But the advantage of this one is that the physical interpretation is, is, is um, it's easier. Uh, you, you can clearly see uh, where the, em the emission is coming from uh, from each from each component. Uh, here, there's an, uh, an interesting comparison. You can ask. Uh, so, in terms of energy density, how does this EBL compare with the CMB? Eh? And we are talking about five percent of the energy density of the CMB. Okay. So, of course, the CMB uh, dominates in terms of energy density, but we have a non-negligible contribution coming from from starlight and and, and dust. Um, so, okay. So. Uh, uh, getting to the end of this detour. Oh, oh there's, so there's a question there. <laughs> Photons. Th that's an interesting question. So this would be hadronic interactions into interstellar medium. So you would produce, uh, usually you produce pi zeros. Oh, okay. So So the question is, could there be also a contribution coming from interactions of cosmic rays with matter, yeah, as, as I understand? Uh, so when that happens, this is a hadronic interaction, so you will produce a lot of pions usually. A fraction of these pions, uh, roughly one-third of the pions will be pi zeros that will decay almost immediately into photons. But these are high-energy photons, right? So uh, usually they will be in the GV energy range. And I'm talking here about the UV, optical, infrared, um, or radio, or microwave. Uh, so, of course, um, a GV photon can interact, can interact with another photon, but it won't be important for CTA. Uh, maybe it's going to, to be uh, important for other uh, experiments in other energy range. But in the energy range of, the, of CTA, uh, which is around 1 TeV, the important contribution is in the infrared, actually. Infrared is really important. So that's uh, why we need to understand dust very well if you want to uh, do this uh, a correction for absorption. Right. Yeah, but the, the answer is there is photon-photon scattering with, the, with these high-energy GV photons, but it's not important for, for, for CTA. Right. Um, so... Um, so I'm going to do a, a, a case study here. So take a very bright AGN, Markarian 501. This is a blazer. So blazer is basically an AGN in which the jet is pointing towards the, the observer, more or less. You can take this as a first approximation. So it's a blazer. Uh, this is the red shift. Uh, so we're on 140 megaparsec. This is the position. Uh, this is a, a highly uh, variable TV source. Uh, for example, in 1997, uh, Hegra uh, caught um, Markarian 501 in flare. And um, here is a, is a more recent uh, sky map of, from, from Hawk, and you can see clearly Markarian here, okay? Yeah. You can see all other uh, blazers like Markarian 421, the Crab Nebula, the Milky Way. Um, so why am I picking up this, this source? Uh, because Markarian had this flare back in the late 90s, where uh, Hegra measured photons up to 20 TV, essentially, 20 TV. So this is a lot. It's a very high energy photon. It's a very high, en high energy photon. And 
if you uh, take your um, uh, preferred, uh, your, your favorite EBL model, and you estimate what would be the absorption uh, for Markarian, and, and the way we do that is looking at the optical depth. So I'm comparing here the optical depth only due to star emission compared to the total optical depth of star and dust, okay? And you see, um, so this is what the data is. So basically, um, there's a, a bunch of, of, of uh, blazers uh, in this plot here. So most of these blazers have a ratio of tall star by tall total uh, around one. So that says, uh, that, says that um, most of these sources uh, are being absorbed by, by uh, radiation emitted by, by stars. Then there, there is some, some outliers here. And then Mark Markarian 501 sits here. So Markarian 501 um, is expected to be absorbed uh, not by, by star emission, but by dust, as I, as I said, basically, uh, a, a few minutes later. Um, so the, the question is, can we then use the uh, Markarian 501 SCD to constrain these, these uh, EBL models, for example, to start to constrain the dust emission? Uh, uh, since it, it, it is expected to be um, uh, absorbed by, essentially, by dust. And so here we did uh, some, some studies. So you need first to um, uh, uh, model the intrinsic emission at the, at the source. So we're going to do something very phenomenological. We're not going to dive into the uh, internal physics of the supermassive black hole. I'm not going to talk about SSC. Huh? like synchrotron with inverse Compton scattering. We're just going to um, uh, adopt some phenomenological uh, intrinsic, intrinsic spectrum, a power law or a log parabola or a power law with an exponential cutoff. And then I'm going to also work with that model, uh, that EBL model in which the infrared emission is, is uh, coming from those three different grain types. And I want to see if I'm able to constrain the fraction of each grain, or the contribution of each grain to the final uh, EBL emissivity, okay? Uh, so you can do this, you can fit Markarian uh, 501 with different intrinsic spectrum. So this is simple power law, log parabola, uh, power law with exponential cutoff. And here are some um, um, uh, fit for the different grain types. Here I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the small grains and these uh, complex molecules that I told you that uh, in principle exist in the extragalactic medium. And in principle, you can fit this, um, but you can also see that depending on your choice of, intri of intrinsic spectrum, uh, the fit, the final fit for the, for the dust fractions can vary, can vary a lot. So, and this is a limitation because you are working with a single source. You take a single source at a single redshift and you try to fit at the same time the intrinsic spectrum and the absorption uh, on the way. So, of course, there's going to be degeneracy. Uh, you, can, you can play with intrinsic uh, characteristics of the, of the emission spectrum with the absorption and still fit the data. Uh, so, if you, if you want to break this degeneracy, you need more than one source. And we need sources at different redshifts, basically. Huh? Um, and here's uh, an example of this. So this is not data any, anymore. This is a uh, Monte Carlo simulation. Okay. So just to simulate sources at different positions, um, um, simulate how these sources will be measured by, by CTA, and then you fit the spectrum. And when you fit the spectrum, you also fit the absorption at the same time. Okay. And here you do this fit for two sources, five sources, 12 sources, and you look at the, uh, uh, at also at how well you fit the, the different uh, dust contributions uh, in the extragalactic medium. And you can clearly see it as you put more and more sources, the, your uncertainty is uh, um, uh, lower, and you start breaking the degeneracy uh, to the way uh, that when you get to the 12 sources, you can pretty much have a, a, a good um, constraint on, on the, uh, what we call uh, polycyclic aromatic uh, hydrocarbonates. And you can also put some uh, nice constraints on the small grains and, and large grains, okay? Um, so, so to have sources at different red, redshift is, is very important here because even though the intrinsic spectrum 
may be varying from source to source, the EBL is the same for all the sources. So that's why you, you can break the degeneracies when you do a multi-source um, uh, fit. Um, well, you can also do that for data. So go for the data. So uh, here um, we are looking at a sky map of all the TV emitters, basically, uh, in this catalog called TV Cat. So in this catalog, there's 54 um, uh, extragalactic emitters. Uh, six of them are flat spectrum radio quasar, 48 are BLX. All these are TV emitters. And you can try to fit this, all these together. And here's the result. Uh, um, so you can see again the these are the posterior distribution for the for the uh, dust fractions, uh, and you can see that you pretty much can can say something about about uh, these molecules in the in the extragalactic medium, uh, these dust grains in the extragalactic medium. Okay. Um, okay. Back to blazer population now. So the main uh, topic of my talk. Um, so this was just to, to make sure that uh, if you want to study blazer population with, T with CTA, there's no way to get away with EBL absorption, okay? You first have to correct this uh, before you do anything else. Um, okay, so now we want to know something else about these, these blazers, right? And one thing that we want to know is what is the probability to find a given blazer at a given redshift with a given luminosity? That's the basic question that we want to, to answer here. And this question, well, there's no answer. There's no clear answer so far, because you, you, can, you can already think that this is, this is a complicated physics, right? We, want to, we are doing with these objects that, are, that have masses of millions or billions of solar masses that form in the center of galaxies, and they form a different redshift in an expanding universe. Um, so there are lots of physical inputs for this problem that are, that are not clear. For example, how a supermassive black hole form? Huh? Does it, is it born with, a, with this supermass, or does it acquire, acquire the final mass through mergers uh, or, or things like that? Right? Um, so we won't go into those details, huh? at least so far. We want to um, uh, take a, a more phenomenological approach in which we parametrize this probability density function. Uh, the, so the PDF here is the, the PDF that tells you what is the probability to find an AGN at a given redshift of a given luminosity, okay? Parametrize that and try to fit uh, the parameters of, of, that, of that function. And then, of course, it's the, it's the job of the theoreticians to come up with the physical um, process that are consistent with this, with this function, okay? Um, so uh, this slide is pretty busy. Sorry, but I'll go, I'll go through it in detail. So here's an example of how you, you model this AGN luminosity function. That's what we call this, this PDF, uh, AGN luminosity function. Um, so here's a given parametrization that was fitted to, um, to, Fermi, to Fermi data, the first year of, of, of Fermi Lat. So they adopted a parametrization. So in this case, the, the, the PDF uh, also uh, depends on, a, on a, an extra parameter, so not only on luminosity redshift, but also on the spectral index, the intrinsic spectral index of, of the source. And, and it's the product of two functions. Uh, one, it's the GLF at z equals zero, so this is the local behavior, so there's a kind of a, of a local PDF. And then there's a redshift uh, evolution. It's a luminosity-dependent redshift evolution, which is this term here. Uh, the local part, it's here. It's this BIST um, uh, at z equals zero. It has lots of parameters. There's a normalization constant. Uh, there are these, these indexes gamma 1, gamma 2, L star. And then the evolution part has also a bunch of other parameters. In total, this parametrization has 12 parameters. Uh, 12 parameters. So yeah, that's the price to pay to go for this phenomenological approach, right? You need a lot of parameters to fit the data. Um, uh, um, but that's it. Um, so the idea is to then uh, fit this these twelve parameters. So here's the here are the values that people at Fermilat got 
for their um, uh, first year data. So they, they had a, a, a luminosity function for BLLAC and another for flat spectrum uh, radio quasar. Um, and here um, is how this luminosity function looks like. So here are just marginalized, uh, if you just marginalize over parameters, that's what you get. So this is the luminosity function as a function of, of redshift. So you can see that BLLACs are the most numerous um, uh, 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 high luminosity AGNs, okay? But you have also some fraction of flat spectrum radio quasar. They have peak, peaks uh, at different redshift. Uh, their, their luminosity function peaks at different redshift. The peak for, for uh, flat spectrum radio quasar is, is higher than, than for, for BLX, but BLX are m um, much more numerous. Then I, I go back to that problem that I, I mentioned at the beginning that, um, so CTA will probably see much more BLX than flat spectrum radio quasars at high redshift. Then there's this question, how to determine the redshift of these guys? Since their optical spectrum has no clear absorption or emission lines, okay? Um, and you, if you look at the luminosity distribution, that's what you, what you see, for example, uh, for BLX in black, for flat spectrum um, in, in red. So you can see here this break, right? There's, there's a change in behavior. So uh, uh, at least for this parametrization, okay? So this is consistent with the Fermilat, Fermilat data. Uh, it shows that, uh, it seems that at, at, at low luminosities, the 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 the, the luminosity function uh, has a certain spectral index, and then at high luminosities, the this index changes. The change happens between 10 to the 47 and 10 to the 48 uh, ergs per per second. You can also look at the distribution of spectral index for for BLX and flat spectrum radio quasars. Uh, they are pretty much Gaussian in this model. If you go back, you, you will see that the, the uh, index distribution, the gamma distribution, uh, is basically a Gaussian, but a Gaussian with a mean that evolves with, with the luminosity, okay? So this is basically what is shown here. This is approximately a Gaussian uh, with indexes around two, more or less, for BLX and 2.5 for flat spectrum radio quasars, okay? Um, okay, so... So then a few questions um, that we would like to answer. So what will likely to be the extragalactic sky seen by CTA in the near future? That's one thing that we want to, to answer. Um, what is the best way, uh, I mean unbiased way, to probe parameters of the blazer uh, gamma ray luminosity function? And how well CTA will determine um, um, parameters of this GLF? And if we can go beyond this phenomenological approach, right? if you can put some physics into these calculations of the uh, gamma ray luminosity function, okay? So, of course, I, I'm not going to uh, go into any of these questions. I'll, I'll basically focus on this first one, uh, which is the first thing that we would like to answer is how will CTA see the gamma ray sky, uh, especially at high redshift, right? Uh, so we can do that now using simulations, huh? as CTA is not uh, fully operated, operating yet. So in this Monte Carlo simulation, what we're going to do is that the, so the intrinsic parameters of the uh, blazers will be sampled from these distributions here, okay? From these distributions. Then um, we will assume that the intrinsic spectrum is basically power law in this, in this analysis. Uh, so then the, the redshift, the luminosities, and the spectral index, indexes will be drawn from the, will be sampled from the distributions that I, I've just shown. Then uh, we will observe these sources with CTA, okay? Uh, in particular, we're going to use uh, something called the Extragalactic Survey, which is a key science project inside CTA, which is basically a very uniform scan of the sky, of the extragalactic sky, uh, exactly to, to determine the parameters of, of, the, um, of the luminosity function. We're going to use some uh, instrument response functions here. So this is a more technical detail. Then a cosmic ray background will be included also, uh, consistent with these instrument response functions. And then we're going to count how many 
blazers will be clearly seen by CTA. What I mean with clearly seen, from the statistic point of view, we want to just keep those sources that are at least five sigma in detection. Okay, they are clearly above the background. Okay, um, so we're going to use um, different telescope configurations. Maybe you've heard something about that in the last days. Um, there's this omega configuration, which is kind of the ideal telescope configuration, and then there's the um, the, the alpha configuration, which is what's going to actually be built. Uh, so you can see the difference between, there are very important differences between the omega and the alpha configuration. If you look at the sounder, only at the sounder observatory, you see here in the, in the omega configuration, the ideal configuration, the presence of four large size telescopes, okay, which are not present in the, in the, in the south, southern um, observatory. So medium-sized telescopes are in both configurations, okay, uh, and in both uh, hemispheres. Um, and here's just the footprint of the telescopes on ground. Um, here is the, is the sensitivity curve, um, the sensitivity curve um, for these two configurations, um, for the northern and, and the sound array. So this is the alpha configuration. Huh? So this is the alpha configuration for north and south. So you can see it. Uh, the sensitivity, and you see that the, min, that the best sensitivity, as I told you, is around 1 TV, a little bit larger than 1 TV. And this sensitivity here is guaranteed basically by the medium-sized telescopes, right? So the medium, medium sizes are the most important uh, telescopes in order to get a good sensitivity around 1 TV with CTA. So if money is short, we will still have the medium-sized telescopes. That's the, the, the message, right? Um, um, so here's the, some properties of this extragalactic uh, survey. So you can see here the region in the sky uh, that, it, that CTA planned to cover in a very uniform way. So it's 25% of the sky, 25% uh, in this range of galactic uh, latitude. So galactic latitude, uh, here's the absolute value, okay? Uh, no, no, it's, it's, it's B, yeah. B greater than a 5 degrees, so you see. This starts at 5 degrees in galactic latitude. And then there is this um, range of uh, galactic longitude. Um, at least so far, the plan is to have 1,000 hours uh, specially dedicated to this to these region of the sky, okay? Uh, with 400 hours uh, uh, being observed with the south and 600 uh, with the north. So if you do the math, you will see that if you do a very um, uniform scan in this region, staying, uh, observing the same time at each point, okay, so the, the, the survey has to be uniform, okay, you will get around 2.21 hours per pointing in the north and 0 0.98 a pointing uh, in the south. And you see that uh, in, from one observation to the other, so that's the typical uh, field of view of one observation, you will you, you have a superposition between the uh, two observations, and even more, three, four superpositions. That is important because it means that one source will be observed more than once uh, during this scan, and this is important. Um, so why is time important? So time is, part, is important because you need to collect a minimum number of photons, right? So it's basically a simulation showing you uh, what a source at this redshift, uh, uh, 421 megaparsec, uh, with this spectral index, would look like for CTA uh, at different observation times, half an hour, five hours, 50 hours, and how well the spectrum is re reconstructed after uh, each of these um, uh, observation times. So, of course, uh, um, time is, is, is an important variable here. So we want to scan that 25% region of the sky with a minimum time in order to see sources farther and farther away, because we want to probe the redshift, the distribution of the of the luminosity function, as uh, as farther as we can. Okay, uh, uh, five minutes. Okay, that's okay. Um, so here um, is a preliminary result on, on on that. So this is the integral flux. Uh, so uh, the minimum flux observed observed uh, 
using this extra galactic survey as a function of the number of, of observations. As I told you, uh, sources will be observed more than once as you, as you uh, scan the sky because of those intersections between observation points. And you can see that uh, the more uh, you observe, huh, uh, the smallest is the, is the flux, is the minimum flux that you are able to, to measure. So you, here you see the comparison between omega and alpha configuration, ideal and the, and the real configuration for south and north. Uh, and this uh, dotted black line here um, uh, points to the target sensitivity. So that was the plan before CK um, uh, 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 um, was even uh, constructed. Um, so this is the target sensitivity, around 6 millicrabs. And it seems that the extragalactic survey would reach that target sensitivity of 6 millicrabs. Okay. Um, and uh, so... Then, then the question, how many sources would, would CTA see? Uh, if, if the sources are following that particular luminosity function, which was param param parameterized by Fermi people and fitted to Fermi people, and of course, Fermi is operating at the GV energy range, right? 10 GV, 100 GV, and CTA will be measuring at, at 1 TV, right? So there was another assumption in this uh, analysis we needed to extrapolate the spectrum all the way from the GV energy range to the TV energy range. So we did that with a certain assumption. We said that the source was emitting as a power law at the GV, and it kept emitting at, as a power law at the TV energy scale. Okay? Um, and here, uh, yeah, it's a, this is pr a preliminary result for the alpha and the omega configuration. So you see the number of detections. Um, for north, for south, for north in, in red, south in, in blue, and, uh, and, and the total number, the sum of the two, north and south, in black, um, for the alpha and for the gamma con configuration. So you see in the case of the alpha configuration around 50 sources, uh, with an average of 50 sources, and uh, for the omega would be around 62 sources. It seems a, a, a low number, right? But, but remember that these are highly statistically significant sources, right? They are all five sigma. Uh, and of course, there, there's a lot, there are lots of sources which are already none, and CTA will also observe them, right? Because they were already detected by Fermi um, and, and, and I, I other ACTs. So these would be only new sources and very, very uh, highly statistically significant sources. Uh, but yeah, but we're still working on that. So um, um, to, you know, um, tune these numbers. OK, um, so just to summarize here, uh, I would say that there is robust evidence of, for EBL attenuation at TV energy range, uh, given those plots that we, we, we've seen before. Um, and if you want to do AGN population study at this energy range, you actually need to properly take into account the EBL attenuation. Otherwise, you're going to mess up with the spectral index of the source or the luminosity of the source. Um, and um, I also want to uh, point to the fact that if you measure the SCDs very precisely, you have sensitivity to not only to the intrinsic parameters of the source, but you also have sensitivity to the absorption on the way to Earth. Okay, and um, okay, CTA has a, a clear potential uh, for this kind of study, and the extragalactic survey, which is a CTA key science project, is is an ideal probe in order to do AGN luminosity function um, uh, studies at the GV to TV energy range. So that's it. Thank you for the attention. Yeah. Questions? So thanks uh, for the talk. Can you go back by your slide right now? Because let's say these uh, numbers are for how long? Uh, the observation time. Yes, the full program or uh, for yeah, a year? So this is 1,000 hours, right? Distributed 400 okay. hours for south, 600 hours for north. So this okay. gives you like on average 2.2 .2 
hours per point in the north and 0 0.98 point in the south. Okay. So it's not much. No, no, no. Not no, much. no, no, no yeah. but uh, so in this way, so with this amount of hours, go back by, let's say, the, the final one, uh, 45. 45, okay. So basically, these are new sources. Uh, new sources, So yeah, new sources true. that uh, were not detected in any other yeah, wavelengths. Uh, yeah, in so you take away f the one that uh, were already known? Well, yeah, this, this is our synthetic sources, right? Mm -hmm. So we are we're not uh, here's not data we just sample sources from the luminosity distribution so they you could interpret them as, as new sources but how yeah. do, how do you cut that the the, the ones that are already known can you cut let's uh, somehow a bending li luminosity so I, I would do let's say above this luminosity threshold all the ones that were there were already taken you, you take away yeah this we haven't done here because this was pure synthetic samples um, because it might be that among these ones, there are already the ones that are... Uh, right, right. So normalize the one that we have there with the one that we're already, already detected, yeah. covering yeah. the different part of the sky. Yeah, because for I think sure. that is quite, uh, quite an important result for CTA. Mm. Sure. Further questions? Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I wanted to know this EBL attenuation that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, can you predict when extrapolating the light curves and spectrum? Like, is it already implemented in Gamma Pi when extrapolating the EBL attenuation that might have, or is something that you see in the future and then you? No, G Gamma Pi already have uh, yeah EBL attenuation there okay. uh, in more than one model, right? I think Dominguez is the one that is mostly used. But there are others, okay, so it's it's in there. Thank it's in there. Gamma Pi rocks. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I have a question. In this uh, study, uh, or or in these studies of the proportion of uh, the different types of grains of dust grains. Uh -huh. um, well, the first question is a little bit, could be a little bit simple, but uh, it is necessary to have the, to know the redshift of the, of the blazers that are used in the study. Yes. Uh, so my second question is, how many uh, red, or, or what is the proportion of, of, of TV blazers whose redshifts are not known? Are not known. Uh, measured ones. Measured ones. Current yes. ones. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, for sure, the problem is with BLX. Yes, More of than course, spectrum, of course. Yeah. Yes, for but BLX. Yeah. Mm, I, I don't have this number on my head, on top oh. of my head. <laughs> yeah. But for sure, this study will have to be coupled in inside CTA with dedicated spectroscopic campaigns. Uh, to get the redshift, that's for sure. Because you know, if if these preliminary numbers are are right, there's going to some 60 or 50 new sources will pop up in the in the CTA sky. L a large fraction of them will be BLX. So we're going to have to have spectroscopic campaigns in order to get redshift. But again, BLX is always uh, um, more delicate. Okay. Okay, and another will be. Uh, in case of the uh, contributions to the EVL, uh, I, I know I'm not, I, I'm not an expert or anything in this topic, but um, in the star formation rate history, I know there, there, there is a lot of uncertainty, yes. especially at yes. high redshift. Yes, yes, so uh, how can this affect the, 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 the EVL? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, it, it affects. That's, that's a very interesting question. So it, he's calling attention to the uncertainties in the modeling of the EBL, right? So I, I have uh, shown here the different ingredients that uh, go into this uh, commoving emissivity function. So the, uh, the HR diagram is pretty much okay, but then there these three parts here are tricky. So the initial mass function, the star formation rate, and this escape fraction. So you can see here, huh? there's a bunch of models and, and they float around. Uh, so for the initial mass function, there's basically two regions here and there's an uncertainty. When you, act, um, so 
what is missing here, of course, is the uncertainty in this in this curves, and they are non-negligible. That's that's true, and that's why uh, CTA measurements will help to pin down what is the actually density of, of EBL photons. So it's a, an extra tool in order to constrain EBL, uh, and but for sure, right now, model EBL is much more uncertain than the CMB. The, the CMB has basically almost no modeling, it's a black body, so we know the physics behind, but for EBL, it's a totally different, different scenario. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to add to your answer about the um, percentage of lasers that have, that have not are uh, known redshift. And at least the data I manage, which is the one I, I have worked with, is that out of the uh, 100, I mean 1,212 lasers in the third catalog of hard sources from Fermilat, uh -huh. Um, 667 of them don't have uh, red chips. Red chips. So we, wor we are working currently with Professor Walter and Paolo Goldoni on this. Um, so yeah, we're, we're trying to fix that. Right, right. Yeah. There is one way around, which is to marginalize over the red shift, right, in this analysis. Uh, if you have a sample of AGNs and you don't know the red shift, you could marginalize, but of course that thing that uh, uh, increases the uncertainty in the final parameters, right? But yeah, at the end, if we don't have the redshift, we're going to have to marginalize over it. Right? Further questions? Um, is there a way to, or do you consider when you calculate this EBL, um, for this calculation, you, do you use, for instance, CMB data in order to constrain the, your simulations or calculations somehow? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, the CMB would enter indirectly here because, uh, as I told you, since uh, these photons are being emitted in an uh, expanding universe, in some way you have to have the background cosmology under control, right? CMB helps you with that, right? We learned a lot about the evolution of the universe based on CMB. Mm -hmm. So it fixed the background cosmology and then you you solve the the equation for that background cosmology. Okay. So in that sense, in that sense. And one last question: um, In the beginning of your presentation, you showed a plot with this uh, big um, deep um, was for the the positron oh. electron oh. Uh, oh, creation right, right. from two photons. Right. And uh, yeah, and, and you showed this Feynman diagram. Yeah. Ah, yeah, no, that's okay. Um, it's curious, this this shape, it's a, uh, what's the explanation of this? Uh, this thing? Maybe you, you exp already explained this, but. Yeah, so this is the mean free path, right? So in order to calculate the mean free path, you need the cross section for the process, and you need to know the number density of, of low energy photons, right? Um, so for this black curve here, solid black curve, this is basically when you plug, when you plug uh, in here, a black body distribution, a black body, uh, consistent with the temperature of the CMB. So this is for redshift Z equals zero, I think. Yeah, I think here Z equals zero. So if you take the temperature of the CMB today, uh, and you, you get the black body spectrum, plug it here, plug the cross section, that's what you got. So it, it tells you that CMB is important, not for, for CTA, but for high energy gamma ray, other gamma ray experiments. So experiments measuring photons around 10 to the 15 or, or 16, like uh, Yasuo, I think, yeah, right? Uh, uh, they would, the CMB is important for them. And if you look at the mean free path of a 10 to the 15 or 16 photon, it's of the order of, of kiloparsec. Yeah. So it means that these photons at Yasuo, a photon of this, at this energy, has to come from the galaxy. galaxy. Yeah. Thank you. Further questions? No? So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.